Welcome everyone to the second seminar of Public Sociology Live. Today we are most fortunate indeed to have with us world famous sociologist Manuel Castells, who is speaking to us from Los Angeles, um, and where he teaches at the uh, USC University of Southern California. Uh, spends half the year there and half the year actually in Barcelona. Though actually at any moment in time, Manuel could be anywhere on this planet. He <laughs> is the most peripatetic and cosmopolitan sociologist that I know. Uh, he was born in Catalonia in 1942, fought against the Franco dictatorship, forced to flee to France in 1962 when he was 20 years old. He pursued in France, in Paris, degrees in political economy and public, socio and public sociology, I wish, public, public, uh, political economy and public law, and then actually got a PhD in sociology. Um, he took up a teaching position at the University of Paris at Nanterre and became involved in the student movement in 1968. The result was he had to flee again. He was expelled from France and he went to Chile, spent two years in Chile, and then returned to Paris in 1970. In the 1970s, he wrote the first of a number of, uh, you might say, disciplinary transforming, disciplinary transforming books. It was the first one was the La question urbaine, the urban question. It's basically brought power inequality um, and social movements to urban space and Marxism to urban sociology. That was the 1970s. In the 1980s, he transplanted himself to Berkeley. In 1979, he came to Berkeley, was professor of sociology and city regional planning. He was there until 2003. And in the 1980s, he actually wrote his second major book, City and Grassroots. Which, was, which compared urban social movements in many of the places he had spent time, in Latin America, in Europe, and in the United States, showing, in fact, the limits of Marxist class analysis and developing such ideas as struggles for collective consumption, what perhaps today we would, in South Africa, they would call service delivery struggles. In the 1990s, he started a sort of a new approach to the city, but centered the new informational technology. He wrote a book um, that, uh, with John Mollenkoff on the dual city, and this provided the foundation for a re-theorization of modernity, nothing less than a re-theorization of modernity, um, the trilogy, The Information Age. Um, in the first volume of this trilogy called The Rise of the Network Society, he talks about the ways in which digital with digital technology um, transformed social structures, transformed the world from a world um, of hierarchies, institutional hierarchies, to a world of horizontal networks. The second volume of the trilogy, The Power of Identity, examines the consequences for social movements of this network society. And the third volume, End of a Millennium, addresses the impact of the network society on different parts of the world, in particular, the way the network society excluded large portions of our planet. In the last decade, Professor Castells has developed the foundation of the network society, namely the revolution in communications and consequences for power, both the communication of power and, indeed, the power of communication. Manuel is actually an obvious first candidate for our course, Public Sociology Live, for three reasons. First, he is a public sociologist whose ideas of social movements, of urban inequality, of the information age, have been widely discussed in many arenas beyond the academy. Second, why is he an obvious candidate? Second, his theory of the power of communication has implications for the very possibility of public sociology, the very possibility of communicating sociology to broader, disparate audiences. And third, why is he so important for our course? 
because our course itself is an exemplification of the network society. It's, we are able to actually have this global reach connecting all these nodes in a network across the planet because of the communication revolution, of which Manuel is the major theorist. So, Manuel, you will talk for 15 minutes, and then we will pepper you with questions for another 40 minutes. So let us all welcome Manuel Castells. Thank you, Michael. I, uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, uh, publicly thank you for this distinction. I very much appreciate it. Uh, we have been friends and colleagues for many, many years, and we have been sharing intellectual projects, political projects, and, and human ideals. So for me, it's really an honor and a pleasure to be here with you, with your students, and with people at large that are listening and interacting with us around the world, thanks to the power of the internet. Um, what I, you, you really describe and very precise and ways uh, my intellectual trajectory. I have been in, in working uh, in all these uh, topics that you mentioned. I have changed topics frequently because uh, any time that uh, something that for me it appears to be important socially and politically anywhere in the world, then I, I don't mind about changing topics, changing fields and, and following so that, that my sociology follows uh, the society rather than the other way around. Um, but, um, uh, but in fact, uh, all my life I have uh, fundamentally researched about just one topic, power, power relationships, uh, in, in its multiple manifestations, be it in the city, in technology, in globalization, uh, in, in social movements, and certainly now in communication. And the reason is that for me, power relationships are the foundational relationship in society. Because whoever um, has power uh, is able to shape the institutions of society according to his, her, its uh, norms, uh, values, and interests. And then institutions uh, are, in fact, relationships of power embedded in the normal functioning of the institutions. Um, that's what we call domination in, in sociology. However, at the same time, uh, societies, fortunately, are never entirely uh, constructed on one single logic. There's always, wherever there's power, there's counterpower, uh, meaning that there are other alternative interests, values from actors that are not fully represented or not represented at all in the institution of society that react, that counteract, and try to reshape the institutions according to their projects. And that's, that's the constant movement of history. Uh, imposition of certain norms of institutions, challenges of these norms, and ultimately what results is this unstable equilibrium, always institutionalized and always called into question uh, in terms of the power relationships that are formed in society, that are formed in production, in consumption, in culture, in, in, in different sources of stratification, and that ultimately uh, through uh, the uh, social mobilization and through the political expressions of these social struggles uh, shape and reshape the institutional society. So that's why uh, if we understand the dynamics of power, um, we understand what I call the DNA of society. And the DNA of society is uh, the, the power relationships. Um, now, in, in history and in theory, uh, as I wrote in, in, my, in my last book, Communication Power, um, the, we, here is, there are many different theories, and we would not go over all these. But for me, essentially, power is uh, constructed in two main different ways. And then there are infinite varieties and combinations. One is coercion, the other is persuasion. Um, on, that is, on the one hand, um, I have uh, the, the old theory of the um, uh, monopoly of violence in the state, the Bavarian theory. Uh, ultimately, if uh, uh, I have power because I have enough capacity to uh, monopolize the instruments of violence, police, uh, 
the judiciary, uh, the army, um, in ways in which I seize the state, I seize the, the, the power of the state through either democratic ways or not democratic ways or manipula manipulatory ways, even if they look like democratic. Once I'm there, I can, I can impose uh, the decisions in this system uh, through violence. Ultimately, or intimidation, that is the possibility of violence in case you don't, you are not a good girl or a good boy, and uh, you don't, you have your own ideas about how society should function. Um, that one, but together with this one, throughout history, uh, it's uh, the, the notion that um, the ability to shape the minds of other people uh, is a fundamental way of power. Um, if if I am able to shape the way you think about society, then I will have a tremendous advantage about the ability to uh, fulfill my interest. I will not have to coerce you. You will be gladly uh, able to follow what I like you to follow. And this is, of course, I'm talking in interpersonal terms, but this is uh, a, 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 social, a social issue and it's a social process. Uh, now, uh, this doesn't have to be considered only in terms of convincing of you of doing something, but of convincing you that you cannot do anything about what it is. In other words, resignation is as potent as uh, mobilization in terms of my interest. And that is the process through the construction of meaning uh, in people's minds, um, a fundamental process. Here, I, one could relate to many different uh, theories here. The, the, for me, the most obvious one in, in it's Foucault, uh, in which the, the, the micro powers that are in all the apparatuses of society. But we can also relate to some great tradition in the Marxist theory, Gramsci. What Gramsci called the construction of hegemony was really the battle of ideas, the battle of the minds of the people. And for Gramsci, that was fundamental because um, uh, for him, he, he was trying to avoid a frontal assault to the state in which he always, uh, since, uh, since he was already in jail, he had little possibilities and was trying to see how ideas could germinate in the minds of the people. And these ideas could change the world through the capacity of people to mobilize autonomously vis-a-vis -vis, um, the institutions that uh, they feel do not represent their interests and values. Now, um, the two forms of power, the two forms of power construction, mix uh, in society and in social practices. But for me, I must say, the fundamental one is the construction, the construction of meaning in people's minds, the battle over the minds of the people. Because ultimately, history shows that uh, violence, pure violence, uh, the, the process of intimidation is ultimately a weak power if it does not rely on this other capacity of constructing meaning. Uh, what was, what's going on in the Arab world today, for instance, is very clear. Uh, was unthinkable, right? Completely unthinkable. And suddenly people are ready to die by the thousands over months and they are crushed with tanks and, and, they, and they are violated in every possible way. And yet their minds are saying, no, I cannot take it. I'd rather immolate myself, I'd rather die. I, I go on. And that's the history of social change. And that's the way in which history changes. Otherwise, through pure violence, if, if through pure violence, the states, apparatuses could control people's lives, our lives, in fact, we would never move. So, but that's a much more subtle form of domination. And what I have tried in the last years to understand is how this construction of meaning in society takes place. And I, my proposition is a very simple one. Uh, we are all um, based on our neural networks and on the perception of the connection between our neural networks with the uh, natural networks of our natural environment and with our social networks of other people. So ultimately, is the connection between these networks in, in the humans, in the human, in, 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 in the human species that is at the heart of human action. Now, in social terms, not in individual interpersonal terms, but in social terms, um, uh, this networking of meaning, this construction of meaning through interaction and network, 
takes place through a process of communication, defined as the construction, the, the, sorry, uh, defined as the sharing of meaning to the exchange of information. Right? Um, so communication is what really ultimately makes us human. This is what is what is distinctive of the human species is meaningful communication with capacity to anticipate the consequences of our actions. So from this point of view, then uh, my, my proposition goes into something very simple. The what I call at the social level, socialized communication is simply the communication that has the potential to reach to the society at large, um, not necessarily to everybody, but has the potential well, to some extent, mass media, to some extent, the internet, etc. And if there is a transformation of socialized communication, it follows there are new forms of construction of power. Transformation, which is technological, and not only, is organizational, is institutional. In the modern context, uh, that means deregulation, liberalization, privatization, means concentration and decentralization at the same time of uh, mass communication through multimedia business networks that uh, are global and local and are all connected and increasingly concentrate the property of the means of communication, and also technological, the capacity to evolve uh, through digital information and telecommunicated networks. What leads me to differentiate uh, in, in empirical terms two major forms of communication in our society. Both are mass communication. One is uh, the traditional form of mass communication, represented, let's say, by the mass media, uh, which is defined by a message from one to many with little interactivity and capacity to uh, be monopolized by the powers of that control the means of communication. The other form, which has emerged in the last um, um, 20 years, but particularly in the last 10 years, is what I call mass self-communication. Um, the communication that has the capacity to process messages from many to many with full interactivity in chosen or real time with a global local reach in horizontal networks of communication whose control is at, at least very difficult from any centralized source and where the senders are the receivers and where people can produce their own content and uh, design and direct their own networks. Um, this is, of course, uh, internet and wireless communication, which is not the same thing as of now, but that they are converging very rapidly. Um, now, the one, uh, I don't have to tell you the, the, the spread of the new form, social network, just give you a little, a little figure that just uh, uh, has been recently published uh, last week. Now, there are more um, social networks accounts in the world than people in the world. There are 10 billion, 10 billion, because I have an account here, an account there, another account in another part. So, in other words, our lives are our networks, and our networks are our lives. But this is not about this idiocy of uh, we live virtually, we don't, uh, we don't see each other, we have lost humanity. No, it's the contrary. All the empirical research for the last 10 years shows that sociability is cumulative, that we live our lives, and part of our lives is in the internet, but we never stop being ourselves. And on the contrary, we shape the internet because we shape the technologies, we shape the, the content through our lives. So our lives produce the internet, not the internet, our lives. This has extraordinary consequences on power uh, because the capacity, the capacity to generate the uh, networks of communication, networks of deliberation, networks of coordination, networks of debate. Um, it's a fundamental uh, process in the construction of autonomy. And the construction of autonomy has become essential for social change in our world under the conditions of a system in which the, the means of production and consumption are monopolized by oligopolistic um, um, financial groups. Our money does not exist. It's virtualized money that exists in the accounting 
non-transparent accounting of the major financial firms. Um, the means of communication in terms of mass communication, traditional mass of communication, are uh, on the one hand monopolized by major uh, business groups, which are um, intertwined with financial groups and with the uh, political dominant actors. And the process of uh, power and government and representation, um, on the one hand, remains largely dictatorial and non-democratic in, in the good part of the world, and on the other hand, has been ritualized and captured from citizenry by bureaucratic politics and political marketing. So in fact, we have no democracy. Um, you know what? This is not a sociological proposition. It would think about uh, 70, 65% of people in the world, everywhere in the world. This is true for the United States. This is true for Europe, etc. This is what we call a massive crisis of legitimacy. So under such conditions, uh, and for the time being, and it will not always be so, the capacity of people to construct the autonomous network of communication, deliberation, coordination, and action becomes an essential lever to have a society able to change itself. And this is what is the theme, hey, of my new book, you are the first ones to know, uh, which I'm finishing writing and uh, under the title Networks of Outrage and Hope, uh, you can imagine, and which of course starts with the Arab revolutions, goes into uh, the indignados movement in Spain, in which I have been fully immersed the last year, goes into the Occupy movement in the United States, uh, uh, in which directly or indirectly I'm also present, and trying to understand at the same time the potential of the new process of communication in shaping this movement, but also trying to show that the key thing is the connection between the network space in the uh, internet and the network space in cities, the connection between cyberspace and urban space, and occupation is the occupation of both cyberspace and urban space as a way to occupy our lives. That's my introduction. Okay, fantastic. Well, you did that brilliantly in 15 minutes. Well done. Um, I'm delighted to hear about your new book. Of course, that was going to be some of our questions were going to be a revolve around this, so we'll hear about it. And as you probably know, that network society doesn't always work perfectly, and sometimes your, uh, your, your body freezes on the screen. But we can hear you loud and clear, which is what is important. Mm -hmm. I assume you can see us. Yeah, I imagine that, that my image was not the most important imagination that you need. <laughs> okay, so so who would like to begin our discussion? Okay, Julian. Hello. Uh, this is Julian Manuel. Sure. Can you see Julian? Okay, very good. Yeah, yeah, I, I, see, I see you very well. Uh, in the opening of your book, uh, you speak of your political activism. But they speak a little bit louder, please, because I don't hear you. All right, and uh, in the beginning of your book, you speak a lot about your political activism. I was wondering, uh, can you elaborate on your political activism and how it helped uh, uh, contribute to your theory of communication power? Let, let, let me understand. Uh, the, uh, yeah, the, uh, the liberal at, the, at the beginning of your book, Manuel, the opening, you talk about you're being a pamphleteer and an activist. Oh, uh, yeah, sure. And you know, so what, in what way did that sort of that history and the Franco regime sort of affect I your see, theory I of communication see. of power? Well, that's not a very theoretical question, but frankly, but uh, oh no, we're not into theory; we're into public sociology here. Yeah, I'm I'm open to any question. No secrets in my life. The police knows everything. Um, <laughs> so, uh, well, uh, for me, it was important. It was absolutely essential. Um, it was essential um, uh, that. Um, um, to follow your project, I think the most important thing for people at large, for every one of us, is to follow your project. Your project can be not individual, but can be collective. Your project can be, I want to save the whale with all my friends. Um, but to construct yourself around your project or your successive projects is essential. And I was not a political activist when I was 16, but I was arrested when I was 16 for writing uh, an article in a student newspaper, and at age 17 for uh, doing theater, and so on and so on. Um, so I decided that for you to follow your project, 
you have to confront the institutions that block these projects. First, first thing that was very important for me. Second, I also understood that um, the, it, things were not so simple. That it's just it's not just that you um, go up and, and protest. And therefore, all my life, I have been trying to understand the, the, the social processes that, together with other people, could actually have an impact on uh, what you want to change in life. So definitely, uh, that was a, a, a critical point. And the, what you mentioned in terms of communication, yes, uh, we understood at that time, as a student activist and working underground, that unless we could communicate with people at large, uh, we were for, good for nothing. We really need to reach out people with our ideas. Now, the point is our ideas were completely crazy, and therefore uh, reaching out people didn't solve the problem of, of the um, absence of, of real ideas. But if you do not establish your channels of communication, um, it's impossible to socialize your action and your projects. Very good. Okay, who would like to raise the next question? PJ? Um, so, uh, in many ways, uh, public sociology stands in opposition to like corporate interests, like market interests, and the neoliberal ethic. However, given, as we mentioned in your, uh, in, the re in our reading, in your book, you talk about how the there's a stranglehold, like the financial or the media networks have a stranglehold over key networks. So given that, how can we ensure that public sociologists are not excluded? Well, um, I think public sociology has to establish its own channels of communication. Um, that, that's what you are doing to some extent uh, through this series of lectures. And I, you know, I have a long experience, uh, not only of, of, of um, social movements and, and alternative ways of communication, but of television. I have given hundreds of interviews in television in many countries. Um, it's, on the one hand, is powerful because, because you reach out uh, the mainstream. Uh, on the other hand, it's so constrained, it's so formative, is so much never in real time. Even if, even when it is live, it's never live. It is always a, a few seconds or a minute of, of delay, so that you cannot say a number of things uh, if the editor doesn't like it. Um, so um, between the fact that uh, journalists would immediately ridicule any attempt to go into deeper analysis, you you have to format yourself to extremely primitive language. Which, to which people are used to. And, and, and when you do that, it's very difficult to say something else than I am for this or I am for that, which is not the role of public sociology. That for me is to uh, help people, help the public to think and, and elaborate and then make their own decision. That's what for me public sociology is. Sociology, for me, public sociology, and I, I think I agree with my friend Michael Lee, is a sociology for the public. Um, is, is, is the sociology that has society, uh, people uh, in front, and not simply academia. Uh, that, that for me, uh, uh, public sociology. And, um, and in that sense, um, the, the, the natural terrain of public sociology is much more the internet networks, the blogs, uh, the, 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 the Facebook or other uh, network groups, the capacity to come together in um, in this, in this, um, in these networks, and also the capacity to connect to all the autonomous spaces of society. For instance, um, when um, I was um, in in London, in Cambridge, giving a series of lectures on these matters uh, last uh, Cambridge, England, um, last uh, November, and then suddenly uh, uh, some people from the Occupy London say. Well, you are giving all these great lectures about communication power and so on. Why you don't give these lectures in the steps of St. Paul's Cathedral? Of course, <laughs> I, uh, and I went there and we had a great time. And I have done this in several other places, of course, Barcelona, but many other places. So that's for me, public sociology. And people were not asking um, that I give a rousing political speech. No, 
they were asking my analysis on communication power. The things that they were not agreeing, they had not necessarily understood, they had other ideas, and that for me, public sociology. So to be, but to be there, and then at the same time, I was giving the lecture there, but they were streaming live all over the world, and now it's on YouTube, and it's everywhere. So this constant connection between the autonomous spaces in the internet and the autonomous spaces in society, be it in the, in the square, or being in 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 um, universities open uh, to the public, this is where I think are the the sites of, of, of public sociology. The rest, yeah, you can write an op-ed here and there, but this is more into the game. Uh, I I do write a, a one page, uh, uh, a one weekly page in the main newspaper of Barcelona. So it's not that I reject that, but. Um, I, I think it's, m it's much more effective to change the role of the intellectual from the public intellectual from the intellectual that goes with the public. Okay. So you're for an unmediated relationship between the sociologist and public. No exactly. one the media. Exactly. Without excluding anything, all tactics, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Everything goes, but, but, but some no, are more important. But, but I, think the, I think we should uh, enmesh ours in the mesh networks. Okay, very good. So, uh, you know, actually, uh, Professor Castells, you this were... This is Lali. Yeah, you were, you know, you were giving your, your conceptualization of, of public sociology as, as being, you know, taking sociology to the public and making sociology accessible to the public. Um, and it, in your efforts to do that, whether it's about communication power or any of your other sociological work, when you take that work to the public, do you also find that that engage that interaction with the public comes to inform or shape your work. Um, so is there is there two ways in that relationship that you as the sociologist take sociology to a public? Does that public come back and shape your sociology or your ideas about these things? Absolutely, absolutely. It's actually very selfish. Uh, the process. <laughs> that, that's how I learn. And the same, the same way, you know, all my life I said and I did, I learned from my students. My fundamental source of learning is my students. Otherwise, you learn a few things at the beginning of your career, and then you repeat them your whole life. Uh, the, the only new uh, information that comes and the and life comes from my students. I, I work on so many things. I could never, never understand many of the things I say without actually having the thing from my students. Look. Uh, one of my research assistants for this book I'm writing um, is um, it's a, it's another woman. Uh, when after the discussion we were having, we don't get this this uh, what's going on in Syria. She said, okay, I go to Syria. So she's going to Syria and come to, uh, we'll come back and then we'll continue the discussion. How I'm going to learn about Syria without uh, my research assistant going to Syria uh, and and finding out uh, and discussing, but it's not she's not doing. It work right so see uh, family etc etc so this is these are the kind of things that that teach me the same thing the in the indignados movement one of the things i told them from the very beginning well i started to participate before getting the idea of writing a book actually i was forced to write this book by my friends in at cambridge university um uh, they made me guilty of, of of being there knowing all these things and not writing a book Socialize your knowledge. Okay, socialize my knowledge. But that was not my idea. But once I decided to start working on this, I told openly to people, say, no, 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 it's very good. You you write and but um, and you say whatever you want, but at the same time you have to reflect the diversity of the movement, the discussion. Um, so in other words, I I give what I can give. Like for instance, I I did one of the projects of the reform of the electoral law in Spain that were debated in the movement. They asked me to do it, and I did it. So I have my knowledge uh, given to, to the movement, but at the same time, I learn everything from what is in mind. The, the, the wrong things and the good things, both. Okay. Dominica. Well, um, from, what, from what you're saying, it seems that public sociology and, and the public actually they mutually construct those networks. Uh, but this is probably most of the times locally. So do you see a role that public sociology could play in bringing those local activities into a global um, level? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I, you know, uh, really what I, 
my my analysis in free transmission globalization is globalization is built on global networks. It's not is not a global thing, a global system, which is undifferentiated. The world is not flat. Don Friedman is absolutely wrong. The, the world is full of diversity, is full of different cultures, different societies, different localities, uh, uh, different identities, different everything. But all this is indeed network uh, in an asymmetrical relationship of power constructed by those who control the global networks. Uh, and therefore, the critical thing to, to reshape globalization, we live in a global world, in, in a globally networked world. So um, it's not a matter of, the, of rejecting globalization. It's rejecting the notion that a particular form of globalization uh, is the only form. So another globalization is possible, as, as the movement people say. So that means what concretely? Means that people live local life. Very few people live global life. Even myself, that yes, uh, um, Michael said cosmopolitan and global. Well, I am multilocal, which is different. Um, a local cosmopolitan. Exactly. Uh, so uh, I, uh, what I, I, I really would say is that you, we all live local lives, but at the same time, we have these local lives connected through networks globally. And in that sense, public sociology has to be global, is global, um, as all disciplines should relate to, to some kind of global experience, but at the same time are rooted in specific local settings and identities. And frankly, here, thanks to the internet, we can be both. And also intellectually, used to be um, a slogan in, in, in the old time before you were born, um, that you have to um, think global and act local. No. We have to think local because that's where we are and act global because that's where the power is. Uh, and in order to, uh, if you just add local and local and local, then you do nothing. So, but we have to start from where we are and that local and then act on the global. And to, to do that without being uh, completely uh, unable to affect the global, we have to interact. So we are, we are local, local and global. And thanks to the internet, both in, in the movement, for instance, uh, we the movement lives at the same time in the internet, but they live in the internet to see what which kind of um, square we occupy now. Um, so, in other words, this connection worldwide, uh, which is essential, absolutely essential, um, it's it's fundamentally um, a network connection from the local to the global. Let me add one thing in terms of this connection in this of this of this networking of experiences um, connecting the knowledge that we now have on in neuroscience which I'm extremely interested in these days um, with the practice of power neuroscientists have found that the most potent human emotion which drives many things is fear fear and they have anchored this in the evolutionary field why? Because uh, those who were not fearful, those who didn't run fast away, fast enough, they were eaten up by the wild beasts. So we are all the heirs of cowards. Um, the courageous were killed fast. Uh, so we are all, our ancestors were cowards fundamentally. That's why they survived. Now, but at the same time, uh, fear prevents us from doing many catastrophes. And, and saves us, but fear is a paralyzing move. And that's exactly the root of power by intimidation. To instill fear, uh, you are going to get a B in your class um, if you continue challenging Marxist theory this way. Um, so um, the way to overcome fear, uh, according to the studies in social psychology, is togetherness. We are all afraid, so we we hold each other. We hold each other. And holding each other, yes, we are still trembling, but let's go together and let's face it. And the first holding is in the internet. Because otherwise you only hold with your three friends and it doesn't work. But if you hold the fear and go public, open in the internet, 
then you overcome fear enough that then you can go into the streets and then die together. Very good. That's very uplifting. In network society, you, you had a much more, rather perhaps a more pessimistic view that, you know, there are all these parts of the world that are sort of switched out and excluded and very difficult for them to organize what you call counter power. But you're a bit more optimistic these days. Well, Michael, uh, I, I tried in my academic work, in my research work, uh, first, as a person, I always have been optimistic. I started fighting at the age of 16, and I keep going. Um, but um, at the same time, very pessimistic about the state of the world. Um, we were criticizing uh, triumphant financial capitalism, but when, when, when financial capitalism is collapsing, which probably the euro will collapse, um, and we'll see the consequences of that where, where we are taking. So, but in my academic work, I always try to keep an analytical distance. Um, not necessarily uh, trying as much as possible, even when I write about social movements, to, to provide knowledge which is, which is as objective as possible, of course, knowing from where I come. Um, and in that sense, the Network Society, remember, uh, was part of a trilogy, and um, the first volume was a structural, not a structuralist, was a structural, were the analysis of the structure of the new emerging society. In fact, that was one volume, and I tried to resist the notion of publishing in three volumes until my, my publisher, John Daly at Blackwell, convinced me, look, Manuel, this is going to be 1,500 pages book. You want someone trying to, trying to read it in the underground and have the back broken under the weight of your theory? Uh, so, but in fact, for me, it's one. And you know, uh, so, so much is one that uh, is forbidden to publish only one volume in, in a translation. Everybody who wants to publish has to publish the three volumes, because for me, it's one volume. So the second volume, The Power of Identity, is full of sex and violence. That, that's where the thing is. Um, so it's, um, and, and the third is all the, the structure and the agency Together. Uh, into action in the major process of social right. transformation. That's right. why. Very good. Very good. Matt, you had a question, remember? Yes, I did. <laughs> Hi, I'm Matt. Um, I was just curious because you speak a lot about the internet and um, its uses in the social networks and whatnot. So what, are you, what is your stance on um, internet legislation of like censoring the internet, such as like SOPA or um, ACTA? Uh, I, I am I'm part of the mobilization, both in, 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 in Europe and, and, in the, and in the United States. Look, uh, if we take seriously that the internet is uh, our main um, tool for uh, relatively free communication, autonomous communication, and this is the basis for citizens' power in society, the defense of freedom in the internet is, the, for me, the most fundamental battle that, that, that we have, the most fundamental battle. Um, if, if you wish, um, if we compare, uh, many of you in, in my old and Berkeley Department are always inclined to historical comparisons, and I also had followed that school. Um, the, the moment in which capitalists triumphed in, in the Industrial Revolution, where they, when they succeeded doing the, uh, the enclosures, uh, the enclosures in, in England meant that person, persons had to be workers, and, and the landlords uh, could become capitalists, and, and they changed the, the class structure and, and their reconstructive power. Well, now, uh, Internet, they are trying to enclose the internet um, and, and use the internet for corporate purposes, for government propaganda, for, for whatever. Um, so that is a fundamental thing. So SOPA in itself is limited and badly done and I think has been easily defeated. Um, but there are much greater dangers coming up because fundamentally governments are contradictory with the internet. Free communication is unthinkable for the powers that be. And internet is based on an architecture of free communication. And we, for some interesting reason, we have very potent allies, some of the biggest companies in the world, like Google and, and Yahoo and, and, uh, and Amazon, etc., are interested in keeping internet free. Why? Because they, they have to stimulate traffic. So as I put it sometimes, and they agree, they're in the business of selling freedom. Um, and since this is the most valuable 
thing for everybody in the world. People are ready to do everything to keep the internet going, and they are making a, a, a great business out of that. So we have potent uh, allies in, in that battle. And we, then we have the dinosaurs of Hollywood and, and the, and the uh, intellectual property rights people who are very powerful. And until now, they have always obliterated any opposition, not with SOPA. SOPA has been their first big defeat. Um, well, it's coming back under a new uh, incarnation, but, but it's, it's still it's, it's mortally wounded, mortally wounded. But other forms of attack on internet freedom uh, are coming up. Uh, in Europe are constant, and you know I have been in many, in many um, commissions, of government advisory commissions, governments, and and um, international organizations, UN, etc. I don't believe too much in that. I am there basically often to learn. Always my thing. I learn from being in places. The first thing in any meeting of this commission, the first thing government say is, how can we control the internet? That's the only thing they care about. How can we control the internet? We're going to say, you know, difficult, very difficult. Say, well, then, then what? We are going to lose control of communication and information? I say, yes. No. We never accept that. Okay, don't accept it. But that's what's going on. So the battle about the control of the internet, uh, of which SOPA is one small but symbolic part, is, the, for me, the most fundamental battle in, in, in our history. Because I, I don't go into all this. Uh, stupid discussion about if the revolutions uh, can exist without the internet or not, if the internet makes the revolution. No, come on. The revolutions are, are made out of the, of the roots of oppression, injustice, humiliation, etc., etc., and people curse to transform their lives and their society. That's what the revolutionary processes are, and that's what the movement is. However, however, this particular type of social movements and revolutions could not have happened under this particular form without the internet and without uh, the, the mobile platforms on which we use the internet nowadays, the technological innovation in the Occupy movement, the way we connect immediately local Wi-Fi with the, 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 the global network. So this is essential, essential. And, and this is the real battle which starts with some kids uh, downloading the music of their lives uh, um, without permission of the authorities uh, to generalize to um, what we can do or we cannot do with the, with the internet. So you are absolutely right, and I think public sociology, in that sense, should be directly involved in analyzing the process. The public sociology is sociology, right? It's not activism, uh, just pure activism. Public sociology is sociology, that is very fundamental research that makes, enables us to understand key processes. So we have to dig the trenches of understanding in what's going on in this battle of the internet, and then deliberating, elaborating among ourselves, and constantly accompanying the uh, the activists who are trying, with great success until now, uh, the, to save freedom in the internet. Very good. Yes. Who would like to ask? That? Yes, Michelle. So, when people from diverse backgrounds do communicate, what can increase the potential for people? <coughs> with high degrees of formal education to hear and listen to more subjugated people's valuable experiential knowledge that societies tend to marginalize because that knowledge isn't the product of a university. Very important matter. I, I think, you know, for sociologists to be public sociologists and simply good sociologists, they have to start from what you say the diversity of the human experience and the direct observation and connection to what, what's happening everywhere in the world in its diversity. Uh, one of my favorite books that I, uh, not because my friend is there, uh, but I use all the time, is the global ethnography book that Michael and other people put out some years ago. Uh, because it's exactly starting from this observation to then make sense. Um, I don't have a, 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 a critique to social science. You know, I um, I have a wonderful granddaughter. I have two. Uh, one is small, but the, the other one was in college, um, and um, uh, just just finished. And um, I will not name the university, but it was a good university. And and after the first semester, uh, 
And I said, so how is it going? She's super smart and very philosophical. I said, well, yeah, all this is interesting, but what you do is called social science. She said, yeah, more or less. I said, well, for me, it's all a big lie. Um, I said, why do you think so? I said, they only talk about books and books and books. They never talk about people. Um, so I'm not saying that you should not read books and, you, and we should not be. <laughs> By one of my criticisms to social scientists in general, in general, including myself, of course, is uh, that we pay too much attention to what other sociologists say, to the latest book that has been written on this and that, and and I am much more for a unmediated relationship to what happens in society, to our interest, to our observation, and then we use all the books. Because otherwise, to read books without knowing why you are reading for, uh, it's a problem. Um, I always say my students, find what, you, what impacts you, find your observation, touch it, feel it. And then what you don't understand or you want to understand better, look for a specific book, that specific article that addresses the issue that you want to discuss. So in that sense, um, without uh, going into, into uh, generalizing the critique of social sciences, of course, but I think we have to be m more ethnographic and less pure theoreticians, but the connection between the two is, of course, necessary. But the accent is on ethnography. Very good. Deline. Um, uh, hi. Um, earlier in your lecture, you said that the construction of meaning in the mind of persuasion is the most important form of power. And I was wondering, how does self, uh, mass self-communication change the relationship of power and maybe probably form more um, powerful counterpowers? I use power a Thank lot. Thank you. <laughs> oh, that's very good. That's a very precise, clear question and very important. Uh, look, um, the mass communication, um, taking a, a very direct um, uh, um, example, I, I, in my book, I spend I think 150 pages in showing, uh, in the case of the United States, how the media shape a power, how the media shape the election, to which mechanism. Um, and that goes beyond the simple thing of the selling of a president. Of course, it's a selling of a president, but but it's, it's much more subtle, it's much more complicated, the targeting, the information that, that companies sell to politicians for such or such uh, district. Uh, all this is, is uh, high-tech politics, which starts by identifying the targets and then uh, using the media in a way that shapes the mind, the perception, etc., etc. of people. Sometimes through a stupid thing, I started crying. I, I, got, I got fewer, fewer votes. Um, uh, for my, mom, my mom died. Ooh. Um, so, that's the stupid way of using the media, but there are many more powerful ways of using the media. So, uh, most importantly, uh, there's a very good network theory. Network theory is a very interesting theory. One of the key elements there is what is called the gatekeeping theory. That, that says if the network is important, if the network communication would really communicate to people, the most important action to shape the communication process is not what is, but what is not. And therefore, the key thing in the mass media has always been marginal candidates can never be other than marginal because they are not in. Uh, is the issues, the problems, uh, the reactions, events, candidates, everything that doesn't fit a certain format, which ultimately, frankly speaking, is decided in the corporate rooms of the business executives of the media, which have their vested interest, but also they negotiate with politicians, with the financial uh, sponsors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All this together leads to editorial policy. And poor journalists try, try to do something like this, and try to do something different, but there are endless cases in which journalists are fired or, or censored or put uh, in front of the decision, okay, you can be free, and unemployed. What about that? Um, so um, this, this, the, the what I call the corporate censorship, 
which is different from the bureaucratic political censorship. It's an extremely important one. So media largely shape the election results. This has been shown again and again. There's a huge literature on the matter, uh, to categories, to other things. And there, again, the use of horizontal networks, internet, wireless networks, etc., even in the electoral politics, has changed, has changed uh, the game. Uh, I did in my book, uh, as you probably know, a very detailed analysis of the Obama campaign, showing that uh, it was decisive. Without the internet, Obama could not have won. Uh, as is, is there, the, the, the data are there, and they show and why, and under which conditions, etc. However, it doesn't mean that the internet uh, was responsible for Obama. What happened is that Obama was able to mobilize young people, and young people on the internet connect directly, uh, very much like uh, in the Arab Revolution. It's young people who largely do the revolution, and these are the young people who are on, on, on Facebook and on the other networks. So um, I'm curious to see what's going to be the role of the internet in the Obama relation campaign, because the enthusiasm is not there, the young people are disaffected, and mostly people who supported Obama will uh, vote against the other guy rather than for Obama. And for that, you don't need the internet. You need just to be, uh, again, designated to uh, politics as usual. Um, but in every instance that you have seen an upsurge of mobilization concerning even electoral politics, the internet, because its uh, ability to uh, construct autonomous networks, has been absolutely essential. And therefore, yes, the media, the mainstream media shape very much uh, politics and power relationships, and uh, the internet op opens up this space, simply opens up. Uh, that, and in this open space, then other things happen that depend, of course, on what happens in society, in people's minds, in politics and ideology. Very good. Now we're coming to the end, so we can have one last question. Who, Ryan. Uh, um, in your piece, you speak of the process which you define as switching, which is essentially the process of connecting networks together and bringing these different groups sort of um, together under some sort of uh, a platform. And so I'm wondering if, if you believe that there is any ascribable elements that are necessary to allow these networks to come together. And if so, when these networks do come together, can they also be destroyed? And what are the elements that would be necessary for these networks to, um, to, to disappear? Well, the important thing about networks and network logic is that they configure themselves all the time. And they change configuration. Um, and uh, at the same time, the, the, the resilience of a network is precisely this capacity to never fix its connections. So if all the networks come together, um, it's either, it depends on how they come together. They it come together as networks, that's called the expansion of the network. So the more a network expands by connecting to other networks, by establishing switches to the other network, the more the network broadens the scope of the networks, then two things happen. On the one hand, the value of the network increases. This is the McCarthy law. <coughs> law. Uh, the, the more nodes in the network, or the more nodes, or the more networks connected with each other, the higher the value of the network. Um, but at the same time, if the network expands uh, at, at a broader scale, it's also more difficult to control the network because you always have other routes, other possibilities of relating to other nodes in the network. However, if by coming together the networks means that they uh, they are um, they, they generate a command and control center that denies the logic of the network and that becomes then a vulnerable point anything that becomes command and control can be obliterated by the powers that be while everything that diffuses decentralizes and emerges as a, an autonomous uh, force by reconfiguring the uh, shape of the network becomes a um, space of freedom. For instance, one of the, in the discussions that I follow now in the movement and around the movement, um, one of the most important ones is, well, uh, the network is leaderless. Uh, so 
uh, how they are going to do it without leaders, without organization, without anything. Well, that's a strength. That's a strength. Because the moment the movement has a leader, then those who don't agree with the leader leave the movement. Um, and you can arrest the leader, you can co-opt the leader, you can do all kinds of things with the leader. But how you can co-opt the leader? You can't. Um, now, the issue there is, all right, then, then what? Then how you reach, what, how you ultimately uh, change? Well, that's exactly the question that nobody has been able to answer. And that's why there is such a debate currently in the movement, which is at the crossroads. Um, how, without denying your nature, without denying the fundamental, horizontal, leaderless, spontaneous character of the movement, still you can impact the institutional society. But the moment there's a provisional answer, but it's, I would say, uh, an intellectual uh, acrobacy. You change the minds of the people. People's minds have already changed. I have a little um, survey from Pew Institute last week uh, in the United States. And remember when we were discussing about the importance or not, the existence or not of class struggle in the United States, that people say, class struggle? That's 19th century. Well, suddenly the majority of American public thinks class struggle exists and is very important. And compared with similar surveys six months ago, the question about social conflict, class struggle, said that people even didn't know what to answer. So then the issue is, it's important or not important that people now think there is such a thing as class struggle in this country and there is massive inequality. Because it was not the case six months ago. If this is important, the movement has achieved it. Now, how you go from there to some change in policies, institutions, etc. Let me finish, because I think my two won't forget me out. Um, let me finish with a historical comparison. I really think, I'm convinced, that we are in the same situation that in the late 19th century, when um, in the working class form, the working class movement form, and of course the, in, the interest, the values, the problems of this um, early working class movement could not be represented by, let's say, the liberal or progressive parties of the politics of the time, or conservative and liberal. So neither conservative or liberal uh, could represent these interests. And the conservatives, of course, reproduce themselves forever. Conservatives are eternal because conservatives are always the expression of the dominant interests of society. And there is, wherever there is domination, there's a party that was to, to represent those interests. But those who were theoretically um, supposed to represent the interests of the populace, the interests of the non powerful, of the semi excluded, the, the rival parties disappear. Disappear. And that's what's happening now, for instance, in Europe with the socialists. In, at least in Spain, certainly, uh, and in, in other countries, we don't go there. But at the same time, from the working class struggles, from the working class movement, from all kinds of spontaneous movements of the world, another political form, another set of political forms emerged, uh, very contradictory ways and very specific to each country. But a new form of politics emerged, but took 20 to 30 years, depending on countries and took many crises, many struggles. So I see, I see at this point, a, a, a long period of transition from these kind of movements who represent the new issues in society to some form of politics that is too early to consolidate. Well, that was amazing tour de force, Manuel. Um, and you've given us a lot to think about. You covered <laughs> not only history, the globe, given a new vision of sociology and of society. What better way to start our series? So thank you very much. Now, let's to, let me just announce that next week, uh, Nandini Sunda will be talking to us uh, about insurgency and counterinsurgency in India and the dilemmas of being a sociologist and a participant uh, observer of such movements. So thank you, Manuel, for being thank with you. us today. And, uh, well, good luck with your project. We're going to try and think locally and act globally. Okay. Thank you, Manuel. Okay. And you actually froze at the end there. But anyway, <laughs> are you still there? 
Um, uh, no, no, no. <laughs> that's fine, you that's fine. To, to stay there. I was going out because you told me one hour now, but no. Oh. no. <laughs> Uh, we can all if you want. No, that's <laughs> great. No, we ju you just froze at the end, so we couldn't see you. But okay. anyway, good. Okay, well, thanks really. Thanks very much. And uh, that Thank was really you. great. It's going to be fantastic for everybody to... Thank this you. is going to be discussed in about eight places in the world in different courses, and presumably beyond that. So. Well, you are my friends, my colleagues, and my, my group of friends. So, thanks. Okay, thanks very much, Manuel. Bye.